Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased today to be joined by Amanda Kirby, um, who's going to be talking to us all about this connection between DLD and, and other conditions and how it's not always quite as clean and simple as we might think it is. Amanda, perhaps you could introduce yourself. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Professor Amanda Kirby. I'm, first of all, a parent of very neurodivergent children and grandchildren who have developmental language disorder and other co-occurring conditions. So I've lived and breathed this for, for quite a long time. Um, I'm Emeritus Professor at, uh, at University of South Wales, an honorary prof at Cardiff University, worked in the field of uh, developmental disorders, including DLD, ADHD, autism, dyspraxia. Um, and I'm also now CEO of Do It Solutions, which is a neurodiversity profiler that I've worked on for the last 10 years. Amazing. So lots of lived experience as well as personal experience, professional experience, which is great. And I guess you can see that, you know, it's not always quite as simple as just having, you know, one thing or one aspect going on. We've got all of these, you know, whole people in front of us to think about, don't we? We do. So I ran a clinical service for about 25 years and most nearly everyone that could come in, children and adults that came in with one thing, rarely only had one thing. They often had other other conditions, but didn't always know about it, didn't always, weren't always diagnosed. And in the early days, I think we kept thinking about these things in silos mm. and you went to see one person, not another person. So yeah, we're messy. People are messy. What are some of the uh, conditions that co-occur with developmental language disorder and, and how do they overlap? So let's start with one that lots of people have heard of, which is dyslexia. And dyslexia and DLD commonly overlap. And that's not a surprise, because if you think about dyslexia, reading, spelling, writing, and developmental language disorder, which is to do with language, they're obviously going to be bedfellows, but we don't always think about it. And about 48 to 87%, depending how you do the definitions and how you assess people, have overlap with dyslexia and developmental language disorder. So we sometimes pick up that children are having challenges with reading, spelling, writing, and then we sometimes jump into, oh, that's dyslexia, and don't stand back and say that could be developmental language disorder. So that's number one. Number two that's really common is developmental coordination disorder or dyspraxia. Different countries use different terminology. Um, and about 30 to 71 percent, so depending again on the definitions and the assessment tools you use, but the point of it is it's common. So, and dyspraxia or DCD are coordination challenges. And often the first sign we see in early years, there's work done by people in Canada, Cheryl Missiuna and other people there, show that the first sign that somebody might have dyspraxia or DCD is because they're late talking. So that over, the overlap between the two is really important. And coordination difficulties are things like handwriting, catching, throwing a ball. Um, it might be learning new skills. So you can start to see that's challenging if you have DLD and DCD together. And then dyscalculia, high rates of overlap between dyscalculia and developmental language disorder. And if you think about maths, it's not just numbers. If I go, go down the street and buy three apples and four pears and it costs this, you're having to read and understand and comprehend the information. So it's not surprising, but sometimes we only think about these things as we're screening for this or we're looking for that in isolation. So, and ADHD, last one that, that is, is common as well is ADHD and about 26% of people have ADHD have um, a language disorder as well, but we really don't think about that at all very often. Absolutely. I think that it just goes to show how complex you know, people's needs can be, but also um, that sort of, you know, uh, original proverb about the elephant. We also sort of look at people from certain angles and certain perspectives, don't we? I like to think as a speech pathologist, I'm somewhere at the head end, you know, thinking about their communication and the way that they think about the world. Um, but, you know, somebody's there looking at the way in which they move. And of course, you know, we're going to see what it is we want to see and, and really starting to think about the fact that all of these can actually um occur and it might be from an education perspective and you're singing my you know talking my language when talking about education because we know that language impacts on you know so many aspects of learning doesn't it but thinking about um the fact that the first thing they might see is actually the attention or the literacy skills um and picking up on that but it'd be you know harking back to our campaign dld awareness day campaign last year you know think language think dld we want it to be on everybody's you know the tip of their tongues
why why do you think it is that some children um you know, they don't even have developmental languages sort of being considered in the mix of this. You know, there's, there's lots of conditions people are thinking about, you know, dyslexia or ADHD. You know, why not DLD? I think I always think DLD is still the Cinderella, which is a shame when you think about it, it's so common. But I think dyslexia has been high up because literacy in school, it's been educationally focused. And um, I think ADHD, to some extent, there's more awareness but still I think it's sort of coming up the back straight in some ways but mm -hmm. autism I think the lobbying camp for autism has been huge and raised awareness even though DLD is far more common than autism um, autism gets a bigger headline you know often discussed and especially in those children who are, are showing emotion sometimes negatively because they get frustrated and then end up being opting out or being opted out of education and it's those points that are really really important as well or before it hopefully we don't need to wait till children get excluded from school to think about DLT so awareness and training I think are big things. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I've got the classic example where, you know, I was uh, going through a diagnostic process with another health professional and said, you know, had you considered developmental language disorder or what you used to call, you know, call SLI or any number of terms? And they said, no, what's that? <laughs> Um, yeah. And, you know, you know, for me, it was a very classic presentation of a child with developmental language disorder, yet um, for this young person, it wasn't even considered. And I think that's often, you know, I work with um, children who've been excluded from school quite a lot. And they, they, and you look at their level of developmental language disorder, receptive language difficulties, and you go, why has nobody picked this up? And I think what happens is you get over-focused on the behaviours and not the reasons for the behaviours. And I think we then go into social and emotional, and, you know, we get SEBD, BES, lots of other acronyms mm -hmm. describing emotion and behaviour. Well, that child's frustrated. They don't understand if I was going to school every day and I didn't understand what was going on uh, and no, and, yeah. people, and I didn't feel confident in asking to mm -hmm. have things repeated, especially if I'm a teen, it's really important for my peers to, to fit in. I'm either going to shrink back or I'm going to kick out. And then you end up either being seen as the quiet child at the back of the class or the annoying child who gets into trouble. You know, So I think it's, again, it's that lens you're looking through. The DLD should be at the top every time and also that should be if a child's got one diagnosis check for dld you know mm. that's what it should be it should be always think across neurodevelopmental conditions don't think in these silos yeah couldn't agree more i don't have anything to add to that point i think it's absolutely true i guess it brings me to my next question is why do you actually think considering co-occurrence is so important oh I think it's essential. If you want to be ch child-centered or person-centered, but I think if you're a professional, whether you're, or you're a parent, we want to help that child or that young person or that adult, if that's what we want to do. And if we want to do our best, we need to think about that child or young person overall. Why would we want to only look at arms and send people off? We've looked at the arms, they're all fine. And the child, you know, we haven't considered the head and the part at all. So I think if we want to do our jobs well, we've got a huge evidence base about co-occurrence. I think we can no longer not consider the other conditions. I think that's co-occurrence is the rule rather than the exception. And I think if we go back to the research that we did in the early days when we were looking at each one of these conditions, what we would often do is screen out other kids in the research. We try and find these pure children who didn't actually represent the children clinically we were seeing who had lots of different things, all right? So I think if we want to do our, knowing what we know, and if we want to do our job well, we have to be child or person-centered. And then we'll get better outcomes. If we don't want to do our job well, we'll look at things in isolation and we won't get the best outcomes. So you, 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 know, you can choose which one you want. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's the beauty of, um, you know, having that holistic lens, but also, especially if you're developing those skills, having a multidisciplinary team, you know, wrapped around these families and these individuals so that we can give them um, a collective uh, view of their needs. But
And I think it's really important that we need to recognize spiky profiles. So everybody comes with strengths in different areas 100%. and challenges in different areas. So we've each got a unique picture of our strengths and challenges. And that's really important, as you say, that if we want to do intervention, often we have to motivate a child because of the things they're interested. So if they love Minecraft or Harry Potter, whatever they, they're reading or doing, or those are the things that motivate us. Because And so by doing a neurodevelopmental understanding and thinking that everybody comes with strengths, interests as well, mm. we'll do better, it's much easier. And I think the other thing is, is it forces us to start to have common language. Mm. So across disciplines as well. So if you mean this, what do you mean? Because when I say that, I mean something different. And by thinking about co-occurrence, we also have to think about how do we work together? How do, and that is better for parents. You know, there's nothing more frustrating for as a parent going from one place to another place to another place, getting one report and intervention, another report. And it's all about that child. And that's where it started 25, 30 years ago with my own son. I'd go from place to place telling his story again and again and again. Um, different histologists using different words and I was a doctor and I and I and I could understand but it was still incredibly frustrating so I think this approach saves time and money which is we've only got so much money you know in, in any organ in any government it seems like in the world we're getting less money but I think the, the, I think what's important for a parent it saves them time and frustration because often you get one diagnosis and then a year later, another diagnosis and a year later, another diagnosis. And that can be exhausting as well. Mm. And starting to pull it all together, I think that um, what I love about you, what you've said is the fact that as a family, as a, per as a parent, I want to know what my child is actually good at sometimes, not just the problems. But if there are things that are ne we're needing to work on that it's being looked at how it's being pulled together and how can we actually address this and maybe there's overlap between some of these areas that we need to consider yeah so um i run a multidisciplinary team a transdisciplinary team for about 25 years and one of the things when we with a, I started with a blank sheet of paper which you think oh, wow how naive is that now <laughs> but but one of the things we spent a long time was looking at how we could have one report. Yeah. So how do we do? So if you were if you're you know doing meal time, doing knife and fork, how can we do turn taking? You know how can we talk about topics of interest? So the the parents aren't doing OT occupational therapy one day. Now that I'm doing speech and language therapy another day. It's the same child, and and parents often have, are busy and they've got busy families, busy lives. So how do we make it more integrated? That it that is more child-centered, more family-centered as well. So why do you think um, some kids with DLD just get missed altogether? You know, they've got uh, all these other labels. You know, wh why are they missing out? Um, I use three Ns, so miss, misunderstood and misdiagnosed. So what we can get is those who are missed because we are so focused on one diagnosis, then we don't look at the others. Some children are missed because they're not in school. So if you get out, if you're not in school or you're in care, a looked after child, and you're moving around a system, then sometimes we overly look at things like attachment disorder and relationships, and we don't consider neurodiversity and DLD in the mix. So we're not considering that. Excluded children, children excluded from education, often have much higher rates of DLD but not in the UK, we see they're not routine, routinely screened. So we're not considering, we're, we're thinking about behaviour. So if we're thinking about emotion, we're thinking about behaviour, or if they're out of the system. Kids who move from homes, so if they're at risk of homelessness, are less likely to get diagnosed with DLD as well. Um, gender differences. So we've often had a gender bias. So we thought that boys have this stuff. And a lot of the research was much more on boys again, so if you look at the research papers, it was easier to find the boys because they were kicking out more, so they were able to be picked up. So, and we're now recognizing that girls can mask more, they can fit in, they're quieter. So they retreat rather than kick out. These are generalizations, of course, and there's often an overlap between gender as well. And then and for the girls, we often get that diagnostic overshadowing so that some uh, girls get seen for their anxiety or feeling very de or depression or self-harm. Um, so we're, and we think about those things and then we don't think about DLD in the mix. 
So as much as I've talked about co-occurrence with, with other neurodevelopmental conditions, we've also got to think about mental health conditions like anxiety and depression and self-harm, that if children are popping up with some of these things, we have to think why, what else could be there and we'll put DLD in the mix. So I think those three areas are really important. So I guess being future focused, moving forward from where we are and where we hope to be, um, you know, what do we need to do about this? Uh, one, raise awareness, bang the right. drum, and that's, what, and that's what you're doing. So that's really important. And I think we need to knock on the door of other conditions and go DLD, DLD all the time. So people get bored of hearing that. But I think we do still need to do that. Um, more training. And I think we need training across neurodevelopmental conditions rather than silos. We need to work as transdisciplinary teams rather, again, so we're optimising the professionals we've got. We need to get information out to parents early so they, they can got strategies. You know, no diagnosis means no intervention. Well, practical strategies up front are a do no harm approach. So helping with how do you engage? How do you turn take? How do you look for the signs? So informing parents. And I think if we can do that, we are going to help children early. We're going to be more child centered. Parents are going to feel more uh, informed and know what to do. And we're going to get better outcomes long term and get more children moving through education effectively and into employment. And I think in the justice system, we see too many adults who have DLD that have never been diagnosed. So I think we also need to be alerting, not just education, but where kids fall out of education and end up in the justice system. We just need to really say, think DLD. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Amanda, to talk about such an interesting topic. And I think it's really topical because we know in October there are so many awareness days and so many, you know, awareness months happening around other neurodevelopmental conditions. So rather than fighting the space um, for DLD, let's work together and actually learn from each other share what we're doing and help build hopefully a bigger, brighter future for everybody with um, neurodevelopmental conditions. I agree very much so. We need to work together to get the best outcomes for our, our kids and their futures. Well, thank you so much again. Um, and hopefully lots of people will listen in and learn from what you've said. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you.